Hey, what's up, Inside Out? Hey, so glad that you guys decided to join us uh, tonight for Inside Out. It's so good to be back. I hope you had an awesome week off last week uh, for your winter break, President's Day weekend, uh, a great break from school, hopefully some time uh, you get to spend with some people you love very much. But I'm so glad you're back here tonight at Inside Out as we wrap up week three of our series on First John. Hey, uh, as I was thinking about tonight and kind of getting ready about how I wanted to kind of get into tonight, uh, maybe I'm, I'm the weird one here. I, I understand as I've gotten old enough in life that I've just embraced the things about me that are weird. Uh, my wife thinks it's weird to me that you guys know when you like download an app or you have to sign up for something, they always give you this long list of like terms and conditions that you have to agree to before you can really do anything online. You know, uh, it, if you've ever had adults, you know, smart leaders, if you pay bills online, you know, you have to agree this consent and all that stuff. And I'm the kind of person that I like read through those. You know how like, you know, it's just like a long list of stuff and I'll like read through the like iTunes terms of agreements because I'm just like, what is in here? Uh, and most of the time it's just a bunch of legal jargon that makes no sense to me, but I'm just always curious. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm agreeing to if I don't read it first. Well, that's because there are certain companies, there are certain people who uh, know that nobody reads that, right? They know that nobody, they just scroll through, get to the bottom and click accept. And they know that people don't read it. And so what they do is they try to take advantage of the fact that people don't read it. Uh, I came across, I, I did some digging this week and found some specific instances of where this has happened. Uh, there's a, a TV show called Canada's Got Talent, uh, which is like a colder, nicer version of America's Got Talent, uh, where uh, they, they basically, when you sign up to be on that show, like it's a, you know, you audition and you get on the show. And when you audition and get on the show, you sign something that says that you consent to being filmed 24 seven, which somebody who saw it was like, hold up, like while I'm like sleeping or showering, like I, I'm not signing up for that. And they like, you know, went online and they had to change everything because they kind of like made a big deal about this like weird consent form. Like I'm not inviting you into my house. Like, I'll do interviews or you guys can come see where I live and stuff. But like, I'm not, I'm not down for that. Because there's like sometimes like really weird stuff that, that people can put in there that if you're not careful, you can kind of get sucked into. But sometimes it's not weird. Sometimes it's actually good or, or at least funny. Uh, if you have Peacock TV, maybe some of you guys have that uh, streaming service online. Uh, they also know that nobody reads those terms and conditions. And, uh, and I can't remember if it's Article 9 or Section 9. Something with a 9 in it is all I really remember. Uh, they have hidden a chocolate cake recipe into their terms and conditions because they're like, I know you're not reading this. In fact, we're just going to put a recipe for a chocolate cake in the middle and just see if anyone notices. And you know, some people have online, but for the most part, nobody catches that. Nobody even knows that that's a agreement. Some of you have Peacock TV and you don't know that you've agreed to a chocolate cake recipe with them, uh, but that's okay. Um, it's not always bad. The TV show Judge Judy, maybe your grandma watches that in daytime TV. Uh, Judge Judy is a TV show where they have these, you know, trivial court cases and she is really mean to them. Uh, anyways, on Judge Judy, if you go on Judge Judy, you have to sign a, a thing to, to go on the show. And in theirs, it literally says, hey, if you come ask a producer, we'll give you five bucks. And so I read a story online. This guy was like, hey, I, was, I came on there. I was a witness in a trial on Judge Judy and I saw this thing about five bucks. So I walked to the producer. I was like, hey, what's this deal with five bucks? And she opens up her drawer, pulls out a stack of $5 bills. And it's like, here you go. We just don't think anybody reads this. So anybody who does, we give them five bucks. It's literally just five bucks just to read the stuff that you signed your name to. And so I thought this was so crazy. And the reason all this stuff exists is because people will take advantage of other people, right? Like humans are naturally broken and sinful and fallen. And we, we, we take advantage of other people who aren't as careful. And so uh, this, come, this came to, uh, I guess, kind of a, a big deal nowadays because it hasn't always been that way. In fact, some of you guys may have seen this on Netflix. There's a documentary on Netflix right now called Pepsi, Where's My Jet? And uh, if you go, it's like a mini series, like four episodes. If you go through and watch it, essentially what happened is in the 90s, Pepsi ran a promotion where you could earn Pepsi points. Like if you bought Pepsi, you got a certain amount of points for all the amount of Pepsi you bought. And you could redeem the points for gear, essentially. You could get hats and t-shirts and jackets and all this stuff with Pepsi brand on it because, I mean, who doesn't want their favorite soda on a jacket? But the idea was to drive, get people to buy Pepsi. Well, this one guy, John Leonard, who was in college at the time, uh, watched the commercial where they were selling it. And at the end of the commercial, in a way to be funny, they advertised that there's a Harrier jet, which is a military grade uh, flying airplane jet, you know, thing that is, you know, average cost would be about $32 million and only available to the U.S. military. But they said, if you got 7 million Pepsi points, you could win a Harrier jet. And John Leonard was like, I'm going to find a way to get 7 million Pepsi points and Pepsi's going to give me a jet. So spoiler, you can go through and watch the documentary, but basically he finds somebody, he figures out you can buy Pepsi points just for cash and it's uh, 10 cents a point. So he raises $700,000 
and buys 7 million Pepsi points and basically sends Pepsi a letter and says, hey, I want that jet. And uh, basically because they didn't put any kind of terms, there was no like, hey, this is, you know, entry only, must be 18 or older to enter, this is just a joke. Like, they didn't put any kind of terms or condition on it. So he calls them out on it and says, hey, I want my $32 million jet that only the military has access to. So uh, I won't spoil this thing for you. You can go home and watch it. But essentially this long court battle ensues because he took them up on it and they didn't put any kind of small writing at the bottom. Well, the reason that, that, that all that stuff exists is because naturally, uh, as human beings, uh, we struggle to understand what people are really trying to get at. In fact, if you've ever been given an opportunity for something that sounds too good to be true, like you can get a $32 million military-grade flying jet for only $700,000 of Pepsi points, uh, it probably is. In fact, if you've heard of something that sounds too good to be true, you've probably asked yourself the question, okay, so what's the catch? Right? What's the, what's the fine print? What's the thing that, that as soon as I start on this, somebody's going to like trick me and realize that it's not worth it. If you've ever signed up for something and like free to, to join this program and it's like for the first three months and after that it's like $100 a month. Like sometimes there's, there's a catch to stuff. That's why fine print exists is because people catch uh, what, the, what, the, what the deal is. And so uh, tonight as we kind of talk about uh, wrapping up our series in First John, maybe some of you have asked yourself this question when it comes to things of faith. Like we, we talk about, you know, at Inside Out or, or at churches maybe you've been to before, we talk about this God who loves you. He's this almighty, omnipotent creator of the universe who looks at you and says, hey, you're messed up, but I love you anyways. And some of you are like, wait, that sounds too good to be true. What is the catch? If that's you, if you've ever wondered that, if you've ever thought that in your mind, I'm so glad you're here tonight because I'm going to tell you what the catch is tonight. Uh, there, there is a catch, uh, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But essentially, that's where we're going tonight. We're, we're wrapping up our series, and we're describing what the catch is. What, what, what's the deal here with this whole faith thing? If it sounds too good to be true, it must be, right? You've probably thought that at some point in time in your life. Well, in uh, the last couple of weeks, we've looked at First John. The first week, we talked about uh, God wants us to take what's in the darkness and drag it out into the light, to, to not live our lives you know, in, hidden in secrecy, but to, to make the, our, our failures, uh, to, to give them less power, we, we bring them out into the light. And last two weeks ago, if you were here, uh, we were in chapter two, we, where God challenges us not to love the things of the world, but more than we love God. So he wants us to love him above all else. And so tonight we're wrapping up this series in, in, in First John chapter four. And so in First John chapter four, John tells us this, starting in verse seven. He says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, we've talked a lot about in the series, and you probably heard over the years uh, many times in your life that God is love and that, that God loves people. And, and in fact, uh, here, here John says that love actually comes from God. Love is actually God's idea. Uh, love, loosely defined, the type of love that John's talking about here is a desire for the other person's best interest, no matter what it costs. It's a desire for someone else's best, no matter what it costs you. So if you think about like the versions of love that we see in the world, uh, you know, maybe you've been to a wedding and the, you know, the, the lovely couple down front are looking at each other's eyes and you're like, wow, they're for sure in love, right? Like that was God's idea. It comes from God, according to John. Or have you ever seen a, a, a mom holding a newborn baby? One of the guys in the band, Brian, he and his wife just had a, a baby recently. And so uh, have you ever seen a mom holding her newborn baby that she's carried you know, inside of her for nine months and she looks at that thing and she just loves it. It's done nothing to earn it. It, it has no standing with that mom other than causing a lot of pain and anguish already. You know, it, it, she looks at it with nothing but love. That's God's idea. If you have a friend that's been your ride or die since day one of kindergarten and you guys are doing high school together and they've got your back no matter what and y'all have been through good times and bad times and everything in between and you know, you're like, hey, I love this person. That is God's idea. All of love stems from, flows from God who created love. So John kind of gives us a picture of what love is. He's like, hey, let us have love for one another because love comes from God. So if you are showing love to someone else, you are being like God in that moment. The next verse, he says this in verse eight, <clears throat> whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If you've ever struggled to love someone, uh, we know that loving people is easier said than done. To have someone else's best interest in mind constantly, regardless of what it, it costs you, is way easier to say than to do. And maybe some of you are, have been through those type of experiences where someone has told you they loved you, but their actions speak otherwise, right? Or maybe you've had a, a, a relationship that was in the past that, that, that you know, y'all told each other that you loved each other. And then six months later, you don't speak and you hate their guts and you've wiped them clean from your social media and you pretend like they don't exist, right? Like basically what they're saying is like, hey, what you probably had was not the true love that God talks about here. 
Uh, it, it was a version of love, but not the real selfless, their, their best interest at all costs, no matter what kind of love that God talks about. Because it says, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Quick show of hands. How many of you guys have heard that before, that God is love? Raise your hands. That's a descriptive word. Yeah, great. Not a new concept. Pretty, pretty popular. If you've ever heard of God or heard anyone like me talk about God, we're very quick to bring up that God is love. But I read something interesting this week that said that like love is not ex- ex- a full description of who God is. God is bigger than love because he created it. So uh, love is a, an attribute of God. But a better way to say it is that God is a description of what love is. If you want to know what love is, you should look to the person who created love to see what it was supposed to be. And essentially for us, that's God. And so that's what I want us to do tonight is to take a picture of, 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 of what love is supposed to be and look at it as God designed it, as he displayed it, and ultimately as he shows it to you and to I each and every day. The next verse, John explains exactly what that looks like in verse nine. He says this, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You see, because God knew and understood that love is a difficult concept for humans to grasp and understand. He knew that we were going to struggle to see love. And, and honestly, as, as English-speaking Americans, it's even more difficult for us because uh, we have this one word, love, that is used in a million different contexts. And it means very different things, right? I talked about this a few weeks ago. I said, hey, when I say I love pizza and I look at my wife and I say I love you, I mean two totally separate things, right? One is like, hey, you taste good and, and I enjoy to, you know, eat pizza in, in, in my life. And the other one, my wife's like, hey, I would literally take a bullet for you. I would not take a bullet for pizza. In verse 10, John goes on to say this. John goes on to say this. This is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is what God means when he says he showed us love. He showed us what love is supposed to be. Is that he says like, hey, when we talk about love, it's really difficult for us to define because we have this one word that means so many different things, right? And he says, hey, I will show you what it looks like. And I will show you through a person. I'll show you through my son, Jesus. And he says that he sends Jesus as an atoning sacrifice. I define that word for you. Some translations, depending on what translation of the Bible you read, call it a propitiation, which is an atoning sacrifice. But basically what John means in this is he says that it is averting the wrath of God by the offering of a gift. So when God sent Jesus, what he was doing was he was showing you he loved you by not giving you what you deserve. What he was doing was he was showing you he loves you by not letting you experience his wrath. I read a lot this week about God's wrath. Um, I grew up in a very different church than Brownsbridge, and maybe some of you did as well, where I heard about God's wrath a lot. And honestly, growing up, it made me more fearful of God than drawn to him because I was basically afraid to make a mistake. I thought that, that if I messed up, God was gonna be mad at me, that, that God was gonna be disappointed in me and that I was gonna have to feel God's anger towards me. But what God means when it says that God is, you know, that, that he's averted his wrath towards us is that God is, by definition, a loving and pure, perfect, and unlike anything in this world, which that word we use to describe that is holy, set apart God. That God is greater than our minds can wrap around, and he is so much better than we could ever have imagined. And so what God do, has done for us, he says, hey, like, you guys have all messed up. You've gotten it wrong, you've failed, you've dropped the ball. But what I've done is I've sent a gift so that you don't have to experience my wrath for your mistakes. What I've done is I've shown you love. I've, I'm looking out for your best interest, regardless of what it costs me. And ultimately what we know to be true and what, we've, what we as Christians believe to be true is that God sent his son Jesus to t- basically take the punishment that was meant for me and meant for you. And in doing so, God makes Jesus, his son, the gift that is talking about here, the atoning sacrifice, the gift that we receive is Jesus in our place and even better, us in Jesus's place. In fact, I tried to figure out a way to illustrate this a little bit better. And so I uh, had some help writing this because my handwriting is not this good. Uh, But what I did was I kind of basically showed what exactly God did when he sent Jesus what he actually accomplished in this atoning sacrifice that we read about in 1 John chapter four, what that actually means is God makes this incredible trade. 
He trades everything that you've ever done wrong for everything that Jesus ever did right. That essentially, Jesus takes our unrighteousness, our failures, our mistakes, that Jesus takes our sins, our guilt, our punishment, our separation from God. He takes all that and he goes to the cross. And in doing so, what God does is he does this amazing thing. And, and because Jesus took all of that and died for it on the cross, God gives us everything that Jesus had. God's one and only son, fully man and fully God. God gives us his righteousness, his perfection, his innocence, his glory, and basically adopts us. He calls us sons and daughters. But when God looks at you in Jesus, he doesn't see your failures, your mistakes. He doesn't see your guilt or your sin. God looks at you and he sees Jesus. He sees every way that Jesus got it right, not every way you've gotten it wrong. Scholars and theologians and people who've studied their whole lives around this stuff call this the great exchange. It's Jesus taking everything that we've done wrong and dying for it, putting it to death. Basically accepting God's wrath on your behalf and on my behalf. And in return, we get the right to be called sons and daughters of God. We get the right to be forgiveness, to walk in freedom. So many songs that we sing talk about the freedom that we experience from God. The last song we sang on stage talked about the freedom that God offers us. That only comes when you've been set free from the guilt and punishment that you probably deserve. When I say that God loves you, this is what I mean, is that God looked at you and said, hey, I don't want you to get what you deserve. I want you to get what you could never do on your own. Earlier in 1 John and back in chapter one, John tells us how to respond to this. He says in, in verse nine, if we confess our sins, if we take what is in the darkness and bring it into the light, that he being God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all of our unrighteousness, all of our mistakes, all of our sins, all of our failures, all of our punishments, all of the things that we've done wrong, God will forgive and purify because he is faithful and he's just. When a mistake is made, somebody's got to pay the price. And what God did is he sent his son Jesus to pay the price for you and for me so that you don't have to pay it. I don't have to pay it. And Jesus has already paid it. And the amazing thing about that is God did that thousands of years before you were ever even born. That you were born into this world knowing that you're going to make mistakes, knowing you're going to let God down, knowing you're going to you, you know, be a, a failure in some ways, knowing you're going to have sin in your life that separates you from God. And God said, it's okay, I've already handled it. The bill's been paid. You have all these because of what Jesus did. You see, time and time again at church, we talk about this idea about God's love and that God's love is unconditional. And that's true, right? You guys know what unconditional means at this point in time. That unconditional means that with, without, there's no fine print. There's no terms and conditions. There's, no, there's nothing you have to read through to make sure that there's not a chocolate cake recipe. There's, there's no uh, $5 bill clause in there. Like God loves you, period, full stop. It doesn't matter if you hate him and you are far from him, if you just heard about him for the first time, or if you've been walking with him for years, God loves you tremendously. There's nothing you can do about it. He has your best interest in mind day after day, no matter what you do, how you're living your life, what mistakes you're making, what people you're surrounding yourself with, or what you're using to occupy your time, God loves you. We talk about that often. But what I think we fail to talk about sometimes, and we, what we offer constantly is this, right? We, we offer you the, the, the trade that Jesus offers us, the grace that comes with that. But I think where we get it short, where people like me often do a disservice to this whole thing is we talk about God's love being unconditional, but God's grace is very conditional. There are terms and conditions that are required. Grace is free to us. You did nothing to earn it. There's nothing you can do to, to keep it. Jesus did it all for you, but it wasn't free. There is a catch, but the good news is, is that Jesus already took care of it. Grace isn't free. Forgiveness isn't free. Your standing before God wasn't free, isn't free. The good news is somebody else picked up the bill. I'll never forget uh, one time I went out to eat with, uh, with my wife, who I've embarrassed the heck out of at this point in time tonight. Um, we went out to eat at a restaurant, and it was like a, an anniversary or some kind of special fancy date night. And we went to uh, a nice restaurant, and we were spending more money than we would normally spend at a restaurant. And, you know, we got the appetizers, and we got, like, nice, you know, meals. And 
We got dessert and the whole thing. And there was somebody in the restaurant who knew us, saw us from across the way, we didn't see them. And worked with the waiter and said, hey, I, I want you to bring their tab to me. And I can only imagine, I don't know what the conversation was like, but I can only imagine and be like, hey, I don't, I don't know if you wanna do this tonight because they're over there spending some money, right? Like this isn't like uh, McDonald's where they picked up my Happy Meal, right? Like they, they're spending some money on this meal. Well, they got like steaks and appetizers and I know they're looking at the dessert menu and Heath can put away some food. So they're like, I don't know if you wanna do this tonight. And the person who loved us tremendously, clearly, was like, no, it's fine. Just bring me their check. I would like to do something for them without them knowing. And I'll never forget when the waiter came and was like, hey, just so you guys know, somebody picked up your bill tonight. I literally was like, who? And they're like, ah, they, they asked me not to tell. And so I literally get up and like walk around the restaurant to see if I could find the person. Cause I was like, I need to thank them. Like I just, pro they probably just saved me like a hundred bucks. Like I really was like going like big at the restaurant tonight. I was gonna try to, you know, like make it like a really fancy, really romantic, nice, nice date night. And somebody else picked up the bill. And all I wanted to do was to go to them, find them and say, thanks. And unfortunately that person had already left. And to this day, I don't know who it was. So if it was you, if you could just tell me after this, it's been bothering me for years. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the idea for me was like, hey, that meal was not free, right? Somebody else just paid for it. In your life, God has amazing plans for you. He has something designed for each and every person in this room, things that he wants you to accomplish, things that he wants you to do, lives that he wants you to touch and people who he wants to introduce himself to because they know you. The catch is you have to know him first. You have to have this bottom part taken care of. Your separation from God has to be fixed. Because in doing so, God has a better life than you and I could ever imagine for you. It's not easy. It's not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna give your life to Jesus and everything goes your way. Like, that's not how it works. But it is a more complete life. It is a more joyful life. It is a more fulfilling life. It is a more grace-filled life. It is a more God-honoring life. It is a more complete, better version of the life that you're living now. In fact, John says it in, in chapter four of 1 John that we've been reading. He says, dear friends, since God so loved us that he sent his son Jesus and he offers us this amazing trade, because he did this, we also ought to love one another. It shouldn't be something that stays with us. People should be able to see the difference in us because of what Jesus did for you. That no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Essentially, God's love, the loop is closed. It is made complete, it is made full when you fully embrace and experience what he did for you through Jesus on the cross. So for me, I feel like uh, at Inside Out, we talk a lot about God, we talk a lot about Jesus. And sometimes we wait for like, a big night, like a, a camp night or, or, or some place that we're like, hey, we're gonna give you guys an opportunity to make that decision, to, to do that kind of business with God to, in order to embrace what God so freely has offered you and has done for you because of Jesus. And I think that sometimes I forget that, you know, God moves in the every day. God doesn't need us to do a big event. God doesn't need me to do anything special. Sometimes God just needs somebody to say, hey, I'm ready. And so tonight, what I would like to do is give you an opportunity, if you've never done that, if you've never accepted this gift that Jesus has done for you, you've never accepted and experienced the completeness, the fullness of God's love for your life, tonight would be the perfect night to do that. Not because there's anything special about today, it's just February 26th. After this, I'm gonna go home and fall asleep on the couch probably because I've talked a lot today. But like, there's nothing, this is just a normal day. But the miracle of what God does is that God uses little everyday experiences to draw people closer to him. And I believe that today is somebody in this room's day. That today is somebody's opportunity to experience the complete full version of God's love and God's life for you for the first time. So here's what I want you guys to do. If you will, everybody in the room, just kind of bow your head, close your eyes. Uh, I'm gonna lead you guys through two prayers. Uh, the first would be for the person in this room who has never given their life to Jesus. And they think this trade sounds awesome. That God loves them so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for all of their failures and mistakes so that their life could be better, so that they could know their creator and experience the complete full version of his love. That sounds awesome. I've never done that. And I would like to not leave here without doing that. If that's you, I would like you to quietly to yourself, just pray this prayer after me. Say, dear God, 
I've messed up. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I've been selfish. I've chased what I thought was best over what you think is best. But God, tonight I finally understand what your love is and what you've done for me. So tonight, God, I confess that I have made mistakes and I want to accept the gift of Jesus' death and resurrection on my behalf. God, I want to experience the complete version of your love, the full version, the version that sets me free and calls me a son or daughter. If that's you tonight, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to do two things. Keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you tonight, if you could just lift your hands in the room just to know that there are people in the room that God is working through. Lift your hand, you can put it up, put it right back down. If that's you in the room tonight, thank you. Thank you for the courage to step out and say, God, I see what you've done in my life. I see what you've done for me. I see how you've gone out of your way for my best interest to love me well. What I want you to do is go to small group and share that with your small group if you're ready, at least with your small group leader, maybe afterwards if you're not ready to share the whole group and let them love you and celebrate you for the amazing acceptance of that gift. Second group of people I wanna lead in prayer tonight is this. There's many of you in this room who've, you've accepted that, that, that gift that God offers, that trade that Jesus died for. You've given Jesus your failures, you've given him your sins, your guilt and your shame, and you've accepted his righteousness, his perfection, his freedom, his innocence in your life. But because you're not perfect and never will be, uh, that's not become the most important thing for you. And maybe tonight you came into this room not thinking about how loved you are by God, but thinking about how stressed you are at school, how anxious you are about things that are coming up on your calendar. Maybe about how depressed you've been over things that have happened in your life. Maybe some of you came into this room tonight just carrying the burden and the weight of uh, stuff going on in your family. And through all of those things that you're carrying, you've lost sight of your creator. You've lost sight of what God set you free from. And maybe you've brought in here a lot of shame and guilt that God never wanted you to carry to begin with. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what you've done in my heart and my life. God, today, I just wanna come back to you surrendered. I've let all the things in life get in the way of pursuing you and experiencing the complete version of your love. And God, tonight, I wanna change that. And God, when I leave here today, I wanna be close to you and I want other people to know you because of what you've done in my life. So God, use me and send me and help me live my life for you. If you prayed that prayer in this room, everybody keep heads bowed, eyes closed for a minute. Just lift your hand up real quick, put it back down just so. Okay, cool, I'm with you, I'm with you, thank you. If you prayed that prayer, I am going to not invite you, I'm going to challenge you to take that small group with you. If you know Jesus, if you know the people in your small group, you know that there are people who love you and are for you. Life is really hard done alone. And if God's calling you to something greater, calling you back to your relationship with Him, don't try to do it by yourself. Find some guys, find some girls, people in your small group to do it with you and help them celebrate you tonight and challenge you to continue to live out the faith that you have in Him. For all of us in the room, I pray that we experience God's love and grace in the fullness each and every day. God, thank you just for Inside Out. Thank you for a place where we have the opportunity to be reminded of how loved we are, of the price you paid for us to be in relationship with you. And ultimately, God, for us to be able to celebrate a Savior who is Jesus. Amen.